to. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. On Money Friday, this is your money, your call. Welcome to the Friday edition of Your Money, Your Call. It's Bonds. I'm Mark Todd from the NAB and I'm joined by Richard Murphy, who is the CEO of the Australian Corporate Bond Company, and Don Stammer, who's the Chairman of QV Equities. He's also a columnist for the Australian newspaper. He's one of the men about town. They're here to answer any of your questions. Feel free to call us, one 300 30, 34, 35. Don't miss the opportunity to speak to us because Don knows everything. And the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Um, and I don't mean that lightly because you are one of the more, you know, mature. learned, mature, the grand man of, of markets. I like to point out to people, Mark, I've now been alive for a third of Australia's European settlement. Yep. And if anyone has a question on the 1952 recession, I remember it vividly. Now remember please that, 1952, ready. please. Because some of our viewers will be watching that. <laughs> they'll, they'll, be, they'll be ready because they'll be still trying to make their money back in the 52 recession. That's right. What drove it? It was just all the war. Oh, the Korean War boom. Oh, was it? The wool got to... Menzies? Was it Menzies M working M around? Menzies and Fadden. Menzies and Fadden. And when the price, commodities, uh, price of commodities collapsed, Fadden introduced a horror budget. Oh, yeah? It took about six months. The economy fell to its knees, and then everyone said, that's over, let's get back to business. Is that sort of what the, the government's done here in terms of this? Is the second budget was better than the first budget in terms of the response by people. But these are pretty wimpy budgets for a government, uh, for an economy that needs some tough measures now. Fatten really had a way of doing it, and he got away with it. It's much harder now to introduce tough policies. Is that because of the way the media sort of characterises it? Everything you think, let's say that might be an appropriate response, the media just really drills into it and looks, you know, gets photos of people who are going to be affected, and it's all... The media love going back to the previous election and seeing who promised what, oh, and that committed idea. to their promise yeah. but also there's so many programs now that have very very big growth over coming years there's not the flexibility there was then because you've got a big theme on the uh, the disability insurance which is obviously a very good initiative because that's you know the right thing to do but you're saying that maybe we haven't funded it it probably will cost twice what has been allowed for yeah so more taxes uh, eventually yes but Volume that's got to be done well my guess is we'll have a, a higher rate for GST, though the Queensland government's very much opposed to that. Yeah. But I also think there'll be other taxes going up. I mean, really, Australia has to face up to all sorts of fiscal problems, else we will have some of the problems Europe's been having, not at the degree Greece has had them, mm. but we, we can't keep on spending money we don't have. The, one of the things that's really interesting is that when we do this analysis, um, Self-funded retirees, one of their greatest fear is regulatory change, tax change. Oh, um, that sort of makes sense in some ways, does, doesn't it? See, don't forget, a lot of people put money into superannuation, paid 30% of that when they put it into superannuation, yeah. and the deal was really they'd have a tax benefits for the rest of their life. And, of course, they put the money in, they were taxed 30% when the money went in, and now there's all sorts of talk that they'll have to pay an additional tax. Superannuation has got a good structure in Australia, Australia, but various aspects of it are, are very poorly thought out and the system's not as viable as it should have been given the bold changes made 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I just I don't know if the government's got the wherewithal to be able to take this on because tax and as you say it's very hard you know you've got to go to an election with a tax plan and that's you know people don't really want to even look at it they just want to have a little soundbite saying I'm going to be all right. And the way the Senate's voted in Australia there'll always be a minority of senators who don't have to face up to the responsibility of being in government. So, but nonetheless, Australia's got a lot more going for it than we're willing to admit in recent yeah. months. But there are big issues to face. Glass half full. And viewers, you see, this could be any sort of show. Your money, your call. We'll just chat. Um, tell me what the Australian corporate bond market is. It's the ACBC. So do you get any sort of weird emails from ACDC fans <coughs> saying... AC, well, yeah. They can't there, there, was a, there were a few uh, was directors who, who voted for ACDC, but no, we thought that was a bit... Right. <laughs> So um, uh, tell me about the Australian corporate bond market. Australian what, corporate Australia bond company, company. Um, obviously linked to the Australian corporate bond market. Um, we are the manager of a range of 
investment products on the ASX, which are called XTBs. And really the genesis was we were guys from um, the bond market, guys from kind of retail markets and exchange markets coming together saying, well, why can't regular investors get access to Australian corporate bonds? Mm -hmm. And we, we looked at it as a potential business opportunity. And when we did, the more we looked at it, the more we thought that the large issuers of Australian corporate bonds weren't about to rush out any time the last few years, certainly, and into the future and bring their senior bonds to the ASX, which is where you can distribute via all of the brokers, the planners, the bank platforms, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, this was a, a business um, born out of post GFC increasing demand for yield and really, really started out one of our directors who wanted to buy a lend lease bond and he'd called his broker, he'd called his a private banker, he called his congressman, <laughs> he called everybody. His broker had actually died in the meantime, which was actually quite amusing. But, <laughs> well, not for the broker. Uh, not for the broker, of course, <laughs> but and I think it was, he was a bond guy, so he doesn't really trade equity. So that was just a length of time since he'd last traded shares. Uh, but he wanted to buy the lend lease bond and eventually he was talking to somebody else and then I was introduced. And right. we started thinking about, well, if it's, if it's inaccessible and they are there, the lend lease bonds are over here, yeah. but they're not over here. How do you get them from here? To hear, you so being the over-the-counter market, this is the you the, the, yeah, the over-the-counter yeah. market. So we yeah. said, well, there's, there's lots of opportunities where that exists around the world. If it's gold, platinum, silver, palladium, or soft commodities, or, or even live cattle, yeah. on the exchange there are securities where you can trade these via some form of wrapper security. So that's essentially what XTBs are. And how's business been? How long have you been going? So we've been going from um, mid-May. Yep. So usually when you, you start up a, you know, a business where you're trying to get a range of products going, the, the important thing is get them up there on the exchange, make sure the plumbing's working, make sure there's nice tight bid offer spreads on the screen, and then build from there. And, and it's really then about education. So the, next, the last couple of months and the next year will be about educating brokers, planners, and investors about, well, what are these XCBs and what, what do they relate to? Corporate bonds, senior bonds, where do they sit in the capital structure and why would I be interested in them? We'll talk a little bit more about the capital structure and what that means, but let's bring Don back into it and tell me what QB equities or who QB equities are and how it all is going. And then talk to me about that paper you write for. I'm not a big Australian fan, I must admit, but anyway, tell me about QB. Okay, QB equities is a listed investment company. It was listed on the stock exchange in late August last year, so we're coming up for our first anniversary. It has about $200 million under management. Right. In Australia, the top 20 listed companies account for 66% of market capitalisation. Wow. And most Australians can own the top 20 stocks quite easily. So what QB equities does is focus on companies outside the top 20. Yep. The manager is Investors Mutual Limited, a company that's led by Anton Tagliaferro, very experienced fund manager. Yeah. And when you think about the three advantage of, uh, advantages of investing outside the top 20, one is the it's a, quite a diversity of companies and that helps diversification. Yeah. A good selection of companies, big and small and industry fields. And also that part of the market's a lot less researched. Oh. So it's a list investment company that helps people do well from investing in a portfolio, a selected portfolio, of uh, companies outside the top 20. And how's the performance been? Uh, the performance has been good whether you measure net tangible assets per share relative to the ASX market excluding the top 20. Yeah. It's ahead and of course the share price has outperformed the net tangible assets. So yeah, yeah. It's been a happy experience. It's one of those things I actually, you know, we might talk about a little later, but I, I actually think the GFC meant that people, investors, don't invest in that space unless, and it's only fund managers do because when the stockbroker rings up and says, look, I want you to buy this little tiny small cap, you know, you, they, they've stopped ringing. The stockbroker stopped ringing because no one wants to listen to it anymore. They just, the GFC drives so many of the investment thesis and that's why you're in, in the game. Yeah, I mean, there's a flight to it. There was a flight to things like index tracking, etc. But I certainly agree with what Don is talking about in terms of the LIC, the list investment market has been a great market for 50 years and the last 10 or 12, um, even though ETFs are kind of a new breed of index tracking things, you know, that's passive management. There's still room for active management, I, I think. What do you think of the ETF right? story versus what you guys do? I think people uh, do well to have a choice. There's ETFs, there's managed funds that are unlisted, there are listed investment companies, there are separately managed accounts. Yep. I think it's good to give people a choice. You mentioned also smaller and micro companies. It's very, very 
very hard for micro-sized companies in Australia to, direct, uh, to attract equity. Oh, but no the mid-sized companies, uh, within QV equities, we've done very well for investors with Sonic Health, uh, yep. probably a share price moved up a bit more than the fundamentals suggest, Energy Developments Limited, yep. PAC, PACT. But, but Sonic Health were quite a big company, weren't they, or, or not? Well, they're not a top 20 company. If you think, you know, everyone in Australia has banks, every investor in Australia has Telstra, BHP and Rio. And to give people a good choice of investments selected and managed, brought in at a low price, taken profits, is, I think, a very good service for Australian investors because in coming years, I think we're going to see some of the companies outside the top 20 become great companies. But they're not known, they're not well researched, so we're very happy with the experience that QV Equities has been able to offer. And I, 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 that didn't come on here to talk about equities, but I, I shall. Um, I did this exercise once. I was working at ASX for a number of years, and you looked at the top 10 now, top 10 five years ago, 15, 20, 25, 30. You go back about 15 years, and you don't recognize them, and you go back 20 years, and none of the, you know, apart from BHP and things like that, are on that list. And it actually, you see some companies now that were way, way, way down the list, and so it does change quite dramatically. And so absolutely outside the top 20, outside the top 50, they will be the leaders of the I mean, that's, but that's the universality of all markets, isn't it? Like, who, who would have thought Facebook, Apple, yeah. all those organisations uh, didn't exist, you know, the internet didn't exist 15, 20 years ago, so, th mm. so that's a challenge. Um, I think that sometimes plays into your role, Richard, in terms of the bond market, in that, you know, there is companies on the cusp coming through, but people aren't yet uh, confident with them, and so they tend to go for the lend lease story. So, so what, what is the nature of the bond market in your mind right now? Um, well, there is now and there has been a wholesale bond market in Australia. It's not as big as people would like it to be. So the, um, the last financial review, you know, the, the chairman of the last financial review suggested it should be a $600 billion market, and it's, let's say it's around a $100 billion market. So it's, it's smaller than it could be relative to the size of equities in Australia and the corporates can go and raise capital in debt capital in, in North America, a couple of different markets there, and in Europe and Southeast Asia, and they can borrow from banks. So there is a, a wholesale market. The problem has always been in Australia, well, where's the retail market? You know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, why don't we have this uh, as, as a retail mm. product as well, so people can truly diversify their portfolio away from equities and, and, and other asset classes correlated with equities into negatively correlated assets such as senior yeah. bonds. So that's, that's where we see you know, part we'll, of our role. We'll talk about it in a second, but we'll go to our first break tonight and we'll be back soon. Now, feel free to call us. It's one 30 34 35 Ask us about anything. 1956 Olympics. We don't care. We'll go for it. Talk to you soon. Hi, I'm Michael Kodari from Cosec. At Cosec, we have a unique stock market filtering system. And right now, I'd like to share this knowledge with you. Just go to cosec.com.au and apply to get your free report. Act now and get cutting edge research covering some of the best opportunities. Michael, so what stock should I buy? When Michael Kodari talks, well, everyone listens. It's our innovation and technical excellence that sets Luxafix window fashions apart. Combining technology with smart design to create our exclusive and superior energy efficient Luxaflex Duet Architella shades. The unique cordless light rise operating system allows you to easily control light and privacy. Luxaflex Duet Architella shades are engineered to perform every time. And with such a great offer, there's never been a better time to discover why smarter design begins with us. What do you want from your home and contents insurance? What do we want from our home and contents insurance? 20% off. Yeah, 20% off. You want up to 20% off, prompt settlement on your claims, and easy application. You want real home and contents insurance. Get real and get up to 20% off. Call 13 19 48 or search real home insurance today. What if we could all be doctors? Good question. But with our cities facing so many healthcare issues, doctors alone are not the answer. That's why Hitachi looks at the big picture. From prevention, to examinations, to therapy, we're using our information technologies and medical equipment to make things better for generations to come. Hitachi Social Innovation. It's our future. 
Hitachi. Hitachi. Inspire the next. Here's an amazing bundle deal from TPG. Get unlimited data with home phone line rental. All for just $59.99 a month. Yep, unlimited data with home phone line rental for $59.99 a month. Connecting Australia to the internet. tpg.com.au We've had the Medicare co-payment scrapped. Now there's talk of an increase in the GST or an increase in the Medicare levy. Just what's going to happen in taxation reform? And our politicians head back to Canberra on Monday. Haven't you missed them? They'll be looking for a new speaker, talking about clampdowns on entitlements. Everyone should operate within the rules. They'll also be arguing about Labor's new policies. All the fun of the fair. I'll be joined by Assistant Treasurer Josh Frydenberg on Viewpoint Sky News Live. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call, The Bonds Show. It's bonds for anything else you might want to talk about. I'm Mark Todd from The Nab, and I'm joined by Richard Murphy, the CEO of the Australian Corporate Bond Company, and Don Stammer, Chairman of QB Equities. He's also a columnist for The Australian, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They're here to answer any of your questions. Call us on 1300 3034 35, and the email is yourmoney@skynews.com.au. Uh, before you email about the size of the bond market, when Richard was talking about the bond market, he means actual corporates as opposed to Sometimes professionals will se separate the bank bonds, so financials and corporates like Lendlease and Transfield and those organisations. And his point is there's not enough of that corporate world uh, entering into the bond market in Australia. They, they can, BHP issued a uh, billion dollars in one day. So it's, it's big enough. It's just a question of, I think to some extent, the rate. So we, we can talk a little bit more about the rate uh, later on in the show, but we're going to take our first email. This email is from Steve, and Steve emailed me last night, uh, sorry, last week, and uh, we didn't get a chance to get to it, so I'm going to scroll down and find it. Here it's on scroll up, 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 up. Um, I've read a lot in the media about how about Greece and how it got to this point. I'm still unclear. Would you and the panel explain to me in layman's terms? Um, how Greece got to their current situation and why it would affect us here in Australia. I'm a science guy, so I would love a cause and effect explanation. Want to have a crack at that one? Let me have a go. The problem for Greece is... Now, this, is a, this will be good. So get ready, everyone concentrate. And it go. only lasts three and a half hours. Perfect. <laughs> uh, the problem is that 19 members of Europe got together for a common currency. Yep. The wise ones like Britain, Denmark and Sweden stayed out of it, but the other 19 went in. Yep. And what that meant is that Greece and Germany have a fixed exchange rate. The problem, of course, is Germany has an efficient economy, high productivity growth, flexible workforce, people retire at 65 or 70, and uh, taxes are paid. Greece doesn't have productivity growth, doesn't have a hard-working uh, community, doesn't pay a lot of taxes. For all the taxes. people in Melbourne watching this show, this is John Don's view, not mine. I think the Greeks in Melbourne are working very hard. I've got Colin Paris, he's a good bloke. Go on. Uh, we're talking, yeah, about the... But so Greece basically pegged its fortunes to being able to match Germany with a fixed exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine if Australia, we had Tasmania, uh, which is a very lovely place to live in, but it, Tasmanians benefit a lot from our grants commission you know how most australians yep. at breakfast talk about horizontal fiscal equity because not that much of my breakfast but i get what i mean but but in australia we have a very efficient system for helping out regions that are falling behind in income yep. and tasmania does very well from that and so it should but in europe there's nothing like that so greece had to match germany then over time people got carried away with the future of the eurozone and people bought a lot of greek bonds saying they're as good as german bonds and that enabled the Greek government to run further into debt. Then when the problems first surfaced, Europe didn't want to admit to the problem, so they lent Greece a lot of money, and of course it built up. In May of this year, the whole Greek debt issues came to a head.
head. And what Greece has had to do now is eat humble pie. They've got to privatise just about every asset they own. They've got to raise taxes, cut back government spending, and really behave. Now, whether it will, whether it can be delivered, it's a very, very demanding. And basically, Greece is ending up with more austerity to stay within the eurozone than they wanted. Greece could, of course, always say it's too tough. We're going to reintroduce the Greek currency, but it wouldn't be popular. It wouldn't be accepted. Probably depreciate 50 percent. So Greece is between a rock and a hard place. This is probably the last chance for Greece to sort things out. My guess is the Europe will patch things up and Greece will stay in, but it all comes back to joining a common currency when you don't have the productivity or the flexibility of policy to yeah. stay in it. And a couple of other things very quickly, Steve, because we don't want to take all the three hours we have suggested, is that the GFC meant that the previous agreements that the Greek governments had put in, uh, everyone said that you can't lie anymore. But the point was that everyone lied. All their, all their arrangements weren't really true. No one really believed it. That was the first one. So that held them to account. And the other thing was that the bailouts, a lot of that money went to the banking sector that had funded into Greece. So they actually saved their own banking sector. That compounded part of the problems because the money didn't actually get to all the Greeks. So that was the other challenge. Um, now, we've, I want to talk to you about the share market versus the bond market. So I want to move away from the Greeks. And hopefully, Steve, that's a good answer for your question. Um, We've got a chart that you've brought in about the share market versus the bond market. And I think one of the things that Don's got a different business, when you go for normal for normal, like, like for like, when you look at these charts, that's a good indice, a good indication of performance. So, Richard, do you want to talk through that chart that you brought up? Sure, yes. Look, this, this, and this is a study we're just about to release where we were looking at um, how do you compare bonds, how they've gone over the long term, say 15 years we've chosen and equities and hybrids. We put in hybrids there as well to really look at those three different, I'd, I'd kind of include hybrids so, as a separate asset class in between, in between the two. So it's a 15 year study looking at um, three indices. So we picked the accumulation index because it reinvests the, the dividends. Of the ASX 200. Of the ASX 200. Yep. And we picked the L3 hybrid index as the, one of the only L hybrid indices around. And then the, the bo corporate bond index, which is the sub component of the the Osbond index, so it's, yep. it just looks at corporate bonds. And we looked at that over the 15 year period and the results actually surprised us, which caused us to write a story around that, which we've just released. Um, because when, when you look at it over the 15 year period, of course, there was a GFC in there. Yep. And the GFC happened um, in its history. Well. And you can see there, equities so, falling quite dramatically and hybrids. Equities are the green line? Equities are the green line and hybrids track down with equities because they are hybrids and that's in fact their economic rationale for being is to protect you know senior bonds and protect um, bank deposit holders etc so they necessarily will track down with equities because they they become more and more positively correlated when when things get tough i guess but of course corporate bonds um didn't and they are kind of slow and steady this so is we, investment grade corporate bonds and um, these are all investment grade corporate yep. bonds so to get in that, to get into that index you have to be an investment grade yep. corporate bond so when, when you look at the annualized um returns as you'd expect equities come out on top because that's what equities are supposed to do and they were about 8.6 percent um 8.68 per, per annum yep. annualized uh, returns uh, corporate bonds were 6.96 but not that far behind yep. and uh, and hybrids were 6.2 which surprised us the hybrids were less than bonds because you'd uh, in intuitively think hybrids would beat bonds but because of the GFC downturn, they didn't in over that 15 year period. And then you look at the volatility of those indices, of course, equities, they're more volatile than those other asset classes. The volatility was 15.28% uh, per annum and hybrids were 57 but bonds being what, what they are, less volatile instruments were 2.3. So it kind of, the, the chart screamed out to us asset class diversification in the first place. Wouldn't we all have loved to have had a properly diversified equities plus senior bonds portfolio? Or, um, maybe some people had equities plus uh, term deposits. Yeah. Uh, and hybrids are kind of in, in, in between. So one of those things, when I look at that, um, you know, a, a couple of things punch out to me. One is the sequencing risk. You know, you, you wouldn't want to retire when everything was collapsing. So that's, that's definitely a bad thing. Um, the, the other thing for the viewers who are looking at this is Part of the benefits have been the fact that the central banks came through and lowered rates and made everything much more valuable. So in the bond market, the consistency returns made it even more attractive because rates were lower. When this started, rates might have been at 6 or 7% and they've gone down to 2 So that's, that's what's happened there as well. 
What's your take on all that? Uh, I think this is a very important graph. It reminds people that volatility is greater than, for shares than for fixed interest assets. And even the bull people who are very bullish for the outlook for shares over three, four, five years, as I still am, must allocate some of their hard-won saving into safe assets, the interest-bearing assets, particularly if they're coming up to retirement. I think anyone retiring needs three, four years of of their drawdown from their uh, superannuation fund in very safe assets, including cash. And I say that uh, even though interest rates are quite low, diversification, safe assets are very important. I think that's one very good point that comes out of this. Another one, uh, I'd underline what Richard has said, that hybrids are not conventional fixed interest assets. I know a number of Australians who somehow believe that hybrids can be seen as part of their fixed interest portfolio. Hybrids are quite a different instrument. Richard said they're halfway between bonds and equities. And of course, the recent hybrids coming out to meet the new regulations for bank supervision are more equities than less fixed interest than yes. before. So mm -hmm. please, everyone, take notice what Richard said about the need for safe assets, the role of corporate bonds in all of that, and that hybrids are not conventional fixed interest. Yeah. And, and if uh, I could ask Richard a question. Sure. Uh, you haven't mentioned bank de term deposit rates and would you like to make a comment about corporate bonds uh, as an alternative to term deposits given that term deposit rates in Australia have tumbled so much? <clears throat> they have and when we when we started out looking at this as a business opportunity they were around four point something between four and five you know some special offers on the five and of course now they're they're you know a three month is probably down you know, around 2.3 or 2.4, 2.5, depending on what you can get. So I guess that's that's uh, part of our sales pitch, if you like, our, our education to brokers and planners is um, term deposits are down around here, hybrids are kind of here for greater risk, and senior bonds sit in the middle where they where they where they ought to sit. And so it really is a question of well, do I am I happy with um, a very you know a short very short term at call cash at say a cash management trust of 1.8, 1.9, or would I take Woolworths risk and be looking at 3.1 for a senior bond, or do I want to hybrid and, and move further up but have the extra risk and the fact it may be perpetual, it may well not mature and doesn't have the same sort of features then if it's not maturing. So um, we kind of see bonds sitting between the, the returns available on term deposits, which have obviously been great and protected people, but as you say, the the the, the yields on those have been collapsing essentially as a result of where interest rates are going. We're going to take a short break and I'm going to try and rebut both these gentlemen. So that is going to be such a challenge for me. <clears throat> so if you want to interrupt us, call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email your money at skynews.com.au. But we'll be right back with an argument. Talk to you soon. Somewhere starts here. Hi, I'm Michael Kodari from COSEC. At COSEC, we have a unique stock market filtering system. And right now, I'd like to share this knowledge with you. Just go to cosec.com.au and apply to get your free report. Act now and get cutting edge research covering some of the best opportunities. Michael, so what stock should I buy? When Michael Kodari talks, well, everyone listens. Can we make big cities feel not so big? As cities get bigger, they get harder to manage. That's why we've developed new information technologies that collect and analyze big data on so many things that touch people's lives. And the more you know, the easier it is to plan a tomorrow where cities feel like home, no matter how big they get. Hitachi Social Innovation. It's our future. Hitachi. Inspire the next. Grandma's gone? Grandpa's gone? Mum says Nan's next. She's got a love Alice Springs. Oh, don't look back, look back to the things you never have. Don't say never say now what you're waiting for. Oh, oh my eyes are open wider than the whole world. Oh, the sky is open wider than the whole world. Oh, 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 o
Hi, it's Helen. I'm calling about real funeral insurance. I just want to make sure my family doesn't have to worry about my funeral costs. With real guaranteed funeral insurance, you're guaranteed cover right now with no medicals or forms. You simply choose the benefit your family receives. Plus, you get back 10% of the premiums you've paid after the first 12 months. I like the sound of that. Don't put off taking care of your funeral costs. Call 1300 337 325 or search Real Funeral Insurance now. Once you have kids, your nights will be in absolute horror. <laughs> your love life will be over forever. Purity is going to be extremely exhausting. I'm driving through. Keep dreaming. Check this out. Welcome back to the show. I'm Mark Todd from the NAB and I'm joined by Richard Murphy, the CEO of the Australian Corporate Bond Company and Don Sam, who is from QB, QV Equities. He's also a columnist from the Australian. I hope you're ready because it is very interesting what he writes about. They're here to answer any questions. one 300 30 34 35 and the email is your money at skynews.com.au. I said we'd have a fight, but we're not really going to have a fight. The, the, when I listen to what you're talking about, one of the things that's really interesting to me right now, today, is the fact that the capital structure is now showing price disparity. There's difference in price. So if I look at the, if I look at a normal bank, you'll get seven and a half, maybe eight percent dividend yield. If you look at hybrid, you'll get 400 over the cash rate. If you look at sub debt, so we're going up the capital structure, folks. So as we go up, it becomes safer. Um, sub debt is probably 200 over the cash rate. Uh, the term deposits that you were talking about and, and the senior bonds are probably about 75 points over the cash rate. So for the viewers at home, the decision is, I think, in my head, it's a little bit of all of it. It's just about how you construct that portfolio, but it, now you've got the capacity to make a decision. Whereas when Pearl 7 came out, 280 over the cash rate, you know, everything is crunched in. Now that it's all expanded, you can actually take a, a slice of all the different pieces of the pie. So I, I think you need to think of these assets as all different roles. Is that is that a fair assumption? I think so. Yeah. You have I think so. I should point out there's probably going to be a test of some of those relativities in the next few months when America starts pushing its cash rate up. Yeah. It's sure to have some effect. But I, I feel a lot more comfortable with the spreads we have now relative to those a year or two ago. Yeah. The funny thing was during the global financial crisis, a lot of people said, I've learned a lesson I'll never forget. And that is you've got to get better returns for risk. Yeah. And within three or four years of the global financial crisis, people are accepting mm narrowing of risk margins quite a lot. Forced by the central banks. It, it is going back, it's back now to a more sensible assessment of risk. There will be challenges though right around the world when America, as it inevitably will, starts raising its cash rate. Which is very important and I want to talk to you about that but we've got a, an email from Barry. Barry is a regular email contributor from Coffs Harbour and he asks why are there no bond licks in Australia? They are the majority in the US. For retail investors like me, I'd love an opportunity to invest, easily invest in long-term fixed interest. Um, and he didn't like the open-ended funds because of the, you know, basically you leave people with the money forever as a bond manager, you've got to hope that they're going to do it right. Um, why, why, you know, QB, why wouldn't there be a, a bond fund like that, a, a, a lick that they're talking about? Well, I come to it from an equities background and QVE. Like a Deutsche, you, you know, you, but you know what I mean, like, you, you know, why, why isn't something like a Deutsche Bank not having organised uh, that sort of, what, why does it not exist? I mean, it's, it's sort of... I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I have a crack at it and see what Don thinks about this, because um, I... I have well, a crack. Getting away from ASX for the last three years, keep on coming back to my, my time there, but... Um, L licks are companies, therefore they're closed-ended yep. structures. Barry says he doesn't like open-ended structures, and um, I kind of understand what he's talking about in relation to if open-ended structures tend to dominate their underlying markets, you can get problems, but we're nowhere near that in Australia, so that's not actually an issue, Barry. Um, but a closed-ended vehicle with bonds in it will probably end up trading at a discount, that's my theory now, and really, if you're really looking at the very um, tight pricing of, of bonds, you don't want it to be trading at a massive discount to the net tangible assets. So the open-ended structure actually takes that away. So there are 12 or 11, I think, 
bond ETFs. They track various indices, uh, mostly broad-based indices, which are laden with government debt. So you really get government returns rather than any high returns. But that's that's not really the point. The point is they do actually track their underlying uh, bond index, whereas I think a lick of bonds uh, with with bonds in it would end up trading at a discount and everybody would be disappointed with its performance. It's different. I mean, I'm delighted to hear QV Equity is actually trading you know, at NAV or at a premium to NAV, which is probably a reflection on, on Anton's yeah. know, stock picking ability. Um, I, I think that point's a very important one. If you tried to do a bond as a leak, there's not the big choices of bonds that you have with shares, and particularly in the share market now where some shares are going up, others are going down. Stock selection is so important for performance. In bonds, they tend to move up and down together. I think it's a fascinating question. I'm sure we'll see some more exchange-traded funds that are bond funds, and now there are exchange-traded funds that are cash funds. Yeah. But, but I just can't see bonds catching on. A very good question, but I think you'll have to be very patient before someone comes up with and such in in terms of access, I actually think the listed sub-debt in the ASX listed sub-debt might be of some interest. You know, we had the bond advisor on a few weeks ago on the on the Thursday show, and he had a portfolio of about 200 over the cash rate. It's all sub-debt, all very short-dated, or it was banks and corporates with um, really short duration. Yeah. And it was just an interesting thing. You could go in as an in as an investor, you could go and buy a thousand dollars, you know, whatever you like, of each one, and, and they had eleven. One will mature in about six months, so ten bonds. You know, you could get two hundred over the cash rate if they all perform, and they were very, very conservative uh, options. Now we have a caller, Mike from Noosa, and he wants to talk about inflation prices. Mm. Hello, Mike. How can we help you? Yeah. Good evening. How are you guys? Good. Good dear. Hey, look, uh, with the recent backup in ten-year sovereign bond yields globally. Yep. Uh, do you think there's any inflation priced into those curves? The second thing I'd ask, look, if you've got time, sure. hybrids, uh, spectrum friendly, not most re recent issuance, six to six and a half percent versus bank stocks at seven to seven and a half percent for the next year. What's the best play? Yep. And uh, who do you think's the best leader of the Western world for the election in the USA 18 months out from, <laughs> from a market perspective? Sure, from markets, no problem. It won't be Trump. Um, on inflation. inflation. Actually, your point is such an important one. I think there's very little inflation expected by bond investors around the world. And given the low inflation we've had since the GFC, given the slack capacity, I can understand that. But when you get to my age, you're a big believer in the long term. Yeah. I've seen two major waves of inflation in my lifetime, in the early 50s and again in the mid 60s. And I do worry about the prospects for inflation if you're looking five, six years ahead. There's so much money being printed around the world. Inevitably, there'll be an economic upswing that brings most countries into it. And somewhere in the next half dozen years, I think we're going to have serious inflation. Thus, I wrote recently on gold and saying the problem for gold is it's not necessarily the inflation hedge it used to be. And quite well, quite possibly, in the next five or six years, people will really take to inflation-linked bonds by top companies and by governments. There's quite a few of them already. I think that asset class will come into its own, not just yet, but when inflation becomes a worry. And when you think about it, the big move in Australia from defined benefits superannuation to defined contribution superannuation means people have to prepare themselves for the next wave of inflation. Not yet, but Mark, in four or five years' time, I think you'll have session after session on Friday night about preparing for inflation. Yeah, uh, look, I think... Um Richard, the thing to look for is in the non-farm numbers, it's the wages growth. I think the real key to all this, this pivoting of inflation will be how the jobless recovery, how those people that were subject to the jobless recovery in the US uh, get the US employers back. I think that they are the ones that have not had a pay rise. It's 2% and they've had it for seven years. And so if they get an opportunity to exercise their muscle, they will be collectively exercising and that could be pretty ugly because basically US corporates have paid back all, all in dividends or share buybacks. They haven't done what the Germans did, which was create productivity. And you could get some serious problems on the inflation front. But at this point in time, there is nothing in the way of inflation ha happening, but I would just look for that. And if you want to hedge, um, you know, you can buy inflation bonds. It, the truth of the matter is, John's right, if we want to have an infrastructure Australia, you'll have to have inflation-linked assets being produced because that's how you 
build hospitals, that's how you build schools because of the, the fee structures. So that's good. Um, we have another caller. We have Clive from Brisbane who wants to talk about... Oh, oh, I can't hear. Oh, you, we haven't spoken yet. Um, didn't you didn't hear anything at all? No. Okay. Oh, and sorry, um, hybrids versus shares. Hybrids versus shares. Oh. You got shares? There... Yeah, sorry, US shares? Uh, any shares. He said hybrids versus shares, Richard asked. My guess is that bank shares will be a better long-term investment than hybrids, but that's for those who can cope with the volatility. You quoted good figures for dividend yields from banks. I think those dividend yields uh, will, be, will persist, but hybrids are fine when things are going well. If we do get to a period in Australian history where ba house prices are dropping and banks' capital looks bad because of that, hybrids would be an asset you'd want to get out of. But uh, I do think you made the point, hybrids are different from shares. Shares probably over time will give people a better return. And I think a much safer asset for uh, a lot of people is uh, corporate bonds, yeah. particularly where people can hold them to the maturity. So if people put their money into a normal uh, open bond fund, the managers of that fund are having to mark to market. In if trouble. interest rates go up, there'll be a loss. Yeah. But if you buy a corporate bond uh, with a maturity that you can cope with, say five years, seven years, three years, you're not going to face a capital loss. No, we've got to take the next question, and hopefully, Richard, you can hear that question, because Richard couldn't hear it and we will come back to you on the politicians in a minute Richard but we've got a, a person on the line we don't want them to wait um, how can we help you Clive oh, how can hi, we help Jen. You? hi Jen how are you going good that's good I've just recently um, uh, bought into some Australian corporate bonds I'm yep. very new to it all yep. um, um, mm -hmm. and in hindsight I'm a little bit concerned about you know the, the potential raising of rates in the US what, what impact does that have on, on, on bond prices in Australia um, so, did everyone, so, Richard, the question from Clive was, uh, he's just bought into corporate bonds. He's now a little bit unsure because of the threat of US rates going higher this year. And what will it do to his, uh, his corporate bonds? <clears throat> That's an excellent question. That's actually a question um, we receive all the time. Essentially, if I can read into your question, Clive, it's why would I buy fixed coupon bonds if I think rates are going to rise, driven by offshore rate rises? Will there be a rate rise here? Um, we're doing another study and we're about to publish this on that very question because it um, vexed our mind or exercised our mind rather in terms of should we do um, fixed coupon bonds or should we do floating rate bonds? In the end, we're going to do both in our next sort of cabs off the rank will include floating rate securities. But on the question of the fixed rate bond, which I assume Clive has bought, um, I think you've got to look at, and the way we've looked at the study is, well, what's the market telling us right now? So we looked at short-term futures. Short-term futures say that in the very short term, talking about the next six months, there is a likelihood of another rate cut before there's a rate rise and rates, rates will, will only start rising into next year. Um, then we looked at longer term, the, you know, the government bond curve, three, threes and tens, three year government bonds and 10-year government bonds where there's a reasonably flat curve. It's not completely flat, but it's not saying that the cash rate is going to be dramatically higher. So that suggests to us, well, have a look. That, that's the professional market saying what it thinks. But notwithstanding that, then we did we looked at a, rate of, a range of scenarios where well, what if there's a 25 or 50 or 100 basis point or 1% rise in, in, in a term deposit uh, rates and therefore the term deposit, would it be better off staying in the term deposit and just rolling from term deposit into term deposit as, as the rates increased. And the study kind of surprised us again, this is why we're publishing it, in that because of the higher yield available, the higher carry, as they, they say in the professional market, available on the, on the bond, it provides a level of protection from a certain amount of rate rises. So if there's a very steep rate rise, um, that's not anticipated market, but if, if there was a steep rate um, rise, um, say, um, you know, 4% in two years, uh, or two percent in, in in a year or something like that uh, which hasn't happened for quite a long time then yes indeed you'd be better off staying in the term deposit and rolling up the curve but have a look at have have a look at the 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 yield on your bond that you've bought and you can actually do this analysis yourself because when we publish this you can have a look at um how we went about it. it's not actually that difficult and actually calculate well how much what the risk you've got yeah what's what is the risk of and how much would rates have to rise before i'm better off staying in staying in the um 
in the in the in the shorter term, say three or six months. We'll, in terms we'll, of go, we'll go for up. a quick we'll go for a quick break because we'll talk a little bit more about that. And because we're the last segment, I want to talk about the dollars about the US dollars. But we'll have a very quick break before our final uh, our final segment of the night. We'll talk to you soon. It's our innovation and technical excellence that sets Luxafix window fashions apart. Combining technology with smart design to create our exclusive and superior energy efficient Luxaflex Duet Architella shades. The unique cordless light rise operating system allows you to easily control light and privacy. Luxaflex Duet Architella shades are engineered to perform every time. And with such a great offer, there's never been a better time to discover why smarter design begins with us. At Optimum, we believe there's nothing better than being free to spend time with your dog. Optimum. Nutrition for life. What do you want from your home and contents insurance? What do we want from our home and contents insurance? 20% off. Yeah, 20% off. You want up to 20% off, prompt settlement on your claims, and easy application. You want real home and contents insurance. Get real and get up to 20% off. Call 13 19 48 or search Real Home Insurance today. Blue moon, you saw me standing alone. The Mercedes Benz C180 Coupe Sport Edition for 56,900 drive away during the C Class Coupe Runout event. It only happens once in a blue moon. Now I'm no longer alone without a dream in my heart. Without a Dick Smith's Dynamite Deals. Getting quick for hot savings store wide. Like 15% off fitness. Plus the Samsung Galaxy Note 4, our cheapest ever, just $6.99. Computers, TVs, audio, hard drives, tablets, and more. Hurry, don't miss out on a Dynamite Deal at Dick Smith. Every day, thousands of people all over Australia prepare their homes for sale. There are gardens to be trimmed, lounges to be cosied up, and final touches to be finessed. It's all about going that extra yard to make that perfect first impression and achieve that maximum price. Because we all know that first impressions always count, don't we? Remax. We sell every home as if it was our own. My sister's gone. She took her husband with her too. They love Darwin so much, they're not gonna come back. Don't look back, look back to the things you never had. Don't say, never say now what you're waiting for. Oh, my eyes are open wider than the whole world. Oh, the sky is open wider than the whole world. Welcome back to the show. It's going hot, so we'll get straight into it. If you don't know who I'm talking to now, you haven't been watching, so you should have been. Um, Clive, my response to your question is this. Uh, you have two types of bonds. You could have got a fixed bond or a floater. If you've got a floater and rates go up, happy days, you'll be getting a higher return in terms of the net return, so people will probably want to try and buy that. If you've got fixed, the question becomes, A, what Richard said, the spread you're getting, so the return you're getting. Let's say you bought a bond that's giving you 6 or 7%, rates are 2 if they don't move for a long time, which is what Richard is suggesting, every day you get closer to maturity, you get closer to being redeemed, you get paid back. So that's a good thing, the spread is a good thing. So in the event you've got a short dated bond, if you bought a 20 year bond at 5%, you're in trouble, call somebody. But if you've got a three year bond that gives you six or 7%, it's about a shorter duration. How quickly will you get paid back the money before people lift rates. So floaters, happy days, short, short dated uh, fixed rate, depends on the spread. You know, let's hope that you uh, have the right response. Uh, you can email me, it's mark.todd.nab.com.au if you want anything else. But then again, I don't have any personal advice that I, I can offer you because I don't know enough about you. That's my disclaimer. What politician do you like for the US? We didn't get back to um, the US par um, election. Who do you like for the economy in general? We've got Clinton and I think there's another guy running around, but 
who on the Republican side out of Clinton? Well, I think it could be amazing if America has another election with a Clinton versus a Bush. Yep. Uh, I think the Republicans do lack credibility, particularly given the extreme views of the Tea Party people. Mm -hmm. I think they'll go pragmatic. Uh, look at how David Cameron won so well in Britain by taking the middle ground. Yep. I think it'll be uh, the, the Bush. The Florida bush. I think it'll be the Florida bush as well. And I incidentally, mean, I was asked at a business dinner recently to write down the three politicians in the world I have most respect for. Oh yeah. Because the world's rather short of really good politicians. I wrote Angela action, Merkel. Action now. I wrote Angela Merkel, oh, John yeah. Key, and Michael Baird. And who? Was Michael Baird. Who's Michael? Oh, yeah. our guy. Our guy. Oh, mate, it's a regional backwater in terms of global. <laughs> but stuff. he's Stop he's it. not a bad leader. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I've lost my train of thought when you bring up that sort of stuff. That really does confuse me. Uh, tell me about, tell me about, that we've spoken about it a little bit, the cash rate, we've talked about the US. What's your thoughts? US rates, do they go up in September? Well, they've been, I mean, they're obviously talking them up. They're saying we're going to, they're giving mark, market the expectation that they will be raising them and we'll eventually be going up. As I come back to, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't have a crystal ball and we, as a business, are intentionally setting out not to try and look forward and make forward-looking statements, but we will observe what the market's saying, the professional market's saying, um, not for the rest of this year. It'll be down before up and it won't be up and it won't go beyond 2% until some stage 2016. So that's our, not uh, our view, uh, but our Non-farm payrolls, oh, and by the way, I do remember what I was going to say. Uh, Richard, if you want to look at something, look at Bush speak in Spanish, because that's the key to it. Because if he can win the Spanish vote in terms of they really didn't like the Republicans, but this guy can talk to them. He is, you know, has a Spanish. And I'm not sure where his wife is from, but he's, he's fluent in Spanish. Kids are all fluent in Spanish. That's the key to it. Watch what the Spanish vote does. My view on the U.S. cash rate is they will definitely raise it before the end of this year. September? But I noticed in a recent speech by the head of the U.S. Central Bank, she used the word gradual or gradually 25 times in one talk. So she's really trying to convince the U.S. market that don't fear and don't worry too much about when the first moves made, look for that very gradual trajectory. And that I think will work until there is a surprise on inflation. I think there will be in the next couple of years. I'm not smart enough to know when. So are you saying this year, let's say September or December or whenever they have the meeting, are you saying it'll be less than 25 basis points? No, it'll be 25 basis points, but just one increase this year. Now remember in June they said, the dot point said there would be two. That's right. And but the markets have moved them, so do you right. think the Fed goes with that move? But also, particular, well, the US dollar has moved up 20% in the last 12 months, yeah. and that is a bit of a restrictive move. Yeah. If they push the cash rate up too aggressively, they'll have a very strong US dollar, even stronger than otherwise, and that would hurt the US recovery. Um, I sort of think they'll go in September, and I think they'll go the least amount, and they'll try and shut the window. What the, you know, what they have to do is lift the Fed funds, make the 10 years rally, and stop the rally in the currency. Very hard to do. Very hard to do. And they're, where they're vulnerable, no one's predicting inflation for America, but every year has its surprise. Every year has its factor X. And what if factor X next year is that with the US job market, unemployment below 5%, corporates suddenly realising they've been very, very mean with the wages they've been paying. Mm. What if the US has inflation of 25 3%? Yeah. That is the risk. And that's why I'm a, a big believer in a balanced portfolio that l prepares people for that kind of activity. Activity. Absolutely. Um, Bill Gross, we spoke about the zombie corporations. For the viewers at home, the, uh, Bill Gross is at Janus. In the uh, August outlook, he wrote that he thinks the rates have to go up because what it's doing is creating zombie corporations in the US. In other words, uh, people can live on the fact that the cash rate is so low, they, they don't, their cost of borrowings are so low, they can just drip on now. Uh, Chris Joy also writes about this, that there's a zombie corporation mentality. I don't think that's really true in Australia, but it's possibly true in the US. And the other point is that retirees can't retire with cash rates here. Mm. Pension funds can't get the return. Um, so that will feed into the system in terms of the retirement benefits. The, the, in other words, the coupon you get as a retiree when rates are at zero. Is he right? You certainly... Right. You, you, both of you have to answer because we've got about three minutes. Okay. 
In the US, they've had the cash rate at near zero since December 2008. That's a very... December when? 2008 yeah. was when the US cut the cash rate to almost zero. So you do have companies that have found it too easy to borrow. They've not really been running a good company. They've not been building assets up. They've just been borrowing, 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 often withdrawing the money in management expenses. So there is a subclass in the US of zombie corporations, and it's a worry. It, uh, my guess is that the sort of uh, increases in the US cash rate we're going to have in the next little while are not going to expose those zombies. But if you go two, three years ahead, it's a big problem. What's your thoughts? Do you, do you agree that this, you know, so because you're offering some returns, it's about the retirees. Is it, is it something that you think is a significant issue? Because A, it's worse in the US, but you know, that means people stay in work and, and people can't have a retirement. Um, you know, how important do you think the, the higher rate will become over the long term? When I think of the court, I wasn't quite sure what to make of zombie companies. I have different images in my mind, but um, when I, the, the thing movies. that worries me the most is um, the lack of get up and go and um, you know, our governor of the Reserve Bank saying, come on Australia, I've, I've, uh, I've brought the water to you at a very cheap uh, rate, you're not drinking it, there's no get up and go around a board table, a management table, that, that worries me more about you know, future growth. Um, that, that's, I yeah. see that in corporates, I see all around, all around Australia. It's sort of glass half full, isn't it? Yeah. Look, so, it's uh, been great. Right the other side. I, I appreciate the fact that you both come on on a Friday night. Especially, well, you could have been watching the cricket. Um, but thank you for all the, the uh, emails and thank you for the fact people rang in. That was great. I want to thank Richard Murphy, the CEO of the Australian Corporate Bond Company, and Don Stammer, Chairman of QV Equities. We didn't talk about the Australian. I don't know why that happened. I'm Mark Todd, mark.todd at nab.com.au. Have a great weekend. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.